very great privilege, honour, to spend a few minutes with Mr Peter Elford, who um, was there on day one, uh, and probably for many days after, thereafter. Yep. Um, Peter was employee number two at Arnett. As I said earlier, the other uh, employee at the time, and there were only two, was Jeff Houston, yep. now the chief scientist at APNIC. Um, the, um, tell us a bit about the CARS report and what led to the, uh, what, was the, what was the lead up to the start of the Arnett project like? Uh, well, once upon a time, um, it will look, look it would be a great story to say that it was all about the technology um, and that the technologists came up with this great solution uh, that everybody adopted, but it was actually the other way around. It was actually a, a top-down decision. Um, in the late 80s, uh, the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee, which is now the University of Australia, recognised that they were starting to see a significant number of researchers wanting to leave the country. There was a genuine brain drain because a lot of the facilities in Australia weren't up to, up to uh, world standard. In particular, there was this new thing called the internet in America, <laughs> um, and centred around what was then called the National Science Foundation Network, or the NSFNet. And it was clear that it was changing the way people did science, the way they accessed big resources like supercomputers. And uh, they commissioned a report by a guy called Brian Cars, Professor Brian Cars, an Englishman who was based at the University of Queensland, to look into the problem and, and suggest a, a course of action, uh, which was, was occurred mostly through 1988. Uh, and the important thing out of the, the Cars report is it said, yes, Australia needs to do something to remain connected um, to the rest of the world. Uh, so that was the good news. Uh, the bad news, it recommended a technology that was pretty rubbish. <laughs> um, so I, um, I don't know how many of you fondly remember the protocol X25. Yeah. Hey, mate, rest in peace. Nice. And, and, and enjoyed the great beauty of sitting on a Cisco router going debug X25 and getting more information than you, you could imagine was possible. Um, uh, he, he recommended, because uh, he'd come from the UK, that they use for this new proposed Australian network um, something called the Coloured Book Protocols, which were based on X25. And each of the protocols, uh, remote access and other things, did have a different cover, coloured cover, and hence the coloured book protocols. Um, but fortunately, um, Jeff Houston intervened mm. in 1988 um, at what was then the original net workshop in Sydney, and he'd come across these new things called routers, and there was this network architecture that would involve uh, a central bridge bridging out to remote sites, and each site, which would be a university campus, would have a router, one router for each protocol, an Apple Talk router, an IP router, DECnet router, uh, and so on. And uh, the key about the technology is everyone agreed. Whether it was good or bad was not the point, but we stopped having an argument about coloured book protocols or, or, or this new IP thing, whatever that was, or whether we should run this open systems interconnect or OSI thing. So um, the key thing was the CARS report said, yes, we should do it. Um, Technology was maybe not great, but fortunately Jeff inter intervened. And I, I always like to phrase this carefully. I, I was employee number two, but I was, I was Igor to his mad <laughs> scientist, right? You know, it was, it was a pretty simple dele delegation of duties. It was, uh, is Jeff doing it? No. Well, then I guess I must be doing it, right? So, uh, and, and a lot of things were like that, but um, uh, he was terrific to work for, and he really was the the intellectual brains from a technical point of view and a political point of view to get it through. And through 1988, um, it, it turned into 1989, uh, and Arnett, uh, this activity within the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee, funded the University of Melbourne to get a link, uh, and which they did in, uh, on the night of June 23, 24, uh, so pretty soon, uh, 1989. And then CSIRO, Maths and Stats got a connection off that, and Adelaide got connected, and then ANU got connected, and then Arnett sort of emerged. I got hired in late 89, and um, all the equipment started arriving and got mm. and deployed through the beginning of 1990. But the CARS report started all. Yep. And, and um, it took only from then when you, were, uh, when you started rolling them out in early uh, 1990, I think it was, uh, yep. April and May, six weeks. Yeah, six weeks. It. What were those six weeks like? Um, uh, completely surreal. Um, and, and mostly, like a lot of things in life, more surreal looking back on it. Um, it was funny talking about network automation uh, today. Uh, so what happened is, you know, there was a procurement at the end of 1989 and a big decision had to be made between the three big router vendors of the time. And who do you think they were? <laughs> no. 
One, Wellfleet, yes. Cisco. Cisco. No, no, no. Proteon. They were the three big router vendors at the time, and uh, in the end, uh, the decision was to go with this funny little startup, um, a bit crazy, called Cisco. I would say, I remember, this is not what we rehearsed, um, the, uh, <laughs> uh -oh. one, one of the venture capitalists, because um, I hadn't joined, but uh, a lot of the decision making was going on in a building at the ANU where I worked, and one of the venture capitalists who had bankrolled Cisco came out to be part of trying to close the deal to win the Arnett business. So it gives you some health idea how small things were uh, back then. Um, but uh, so, you know, I, my first job was, oh, we've decided to buy Cisco uh, routery things. You need to work out what to order. And I had no idea. I'd never even seen a Cisco router at that stage and kind of worked it out. But when they arrived and we started to play with them, it was like, oh, I've got to generate 40 router configs. How can I do that? And I'd like to think it was the first network automation experience. Um, some of you might remember Macintosh computers with the uh, programming language called HyperCard. So I wrote all these horrible yep. HyperCard scripts to generate the configs, which we then copy and pasted into the routers. Uh, we put them in boxes. We shipped them out to all the university sites and said, uh, one of Jeff or I will come and visit you and connect the router. And so Jeff went to Queensland and WA and South Australia, all the places that had sunshine. He, he got the warm ones. Yeah, he got the warm yeah. ones. Yeah. And nice. I did Tasmania, you know, <laughs> ACT in New South Wales and Melbourne or something like that. And uh, it, was a, it was a bizarre experience uh, because the, the routers are pre-configured and we literally took them out, plugged the power on, plugged in the blazingly fast 48K digital data service that we bought from Telstra. Uh, and plugged it into the local LAN, turned it on, it worked. And it was just... These were the days before gotta, security. Before security, right? So the routers had like about 10, 12 lines of config, you know, network, network addresses, router rip, you know, yeah, default addresses up the serial port. <laughs> what else do you need? And, and sh yeah, there were no loops in the network, so rip was fine. And Well, it was fine until the first Unix host popped up at Macquarie University, as it turned out advertising default and all the routers suddenly believed it so all the traffic from the US went to Macquarie and <laughs> bad things happened. But, but the first six weeks really were um, just really um, the first experience of, of, of a plug and play network. You literally shipped them, turned them on and it just worked and became part of the internet. Mm. You know, it was just, it was amazing. And things have changed surprisingly little in that time in terms of the challenges yeah. that, yeah. that network engineers are facing today. But uh, the next three years, uh, the network grew from a small number of nodes to having, as I understand it, 40,000 computers attached to it. And tell us a bit about the challenges that came with the growth and demand for uh, the internet in Australia, which um, was Arnet back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so, you know, the, that was the internet. I mean, I often have told a lot of people about, you know, why does Arnet exist? Well, it's because the universities wanted to get connected to the internet in 1989. You couldn't buy it in 1989, so you had to build it. So Arnett built the internet in Australia. Uh, I think it's really important um, that uh, us networking nerds, I still claim networking nerd status, um, <laughs> don't forget that. It was the universities who got the internet to Australia first. Sure, it would have eventually got here, but it, it was is pioneered by, by Arnett, by the Australian Vice Chancellor's Committee and the leadership of the Australian universities. And it was really quite a, a good moment for all of us, and I, I mean, you know, all of us unis um, and, and Arnett staff to see Margaret Gardner, the chair of the University of Australia until recently, to actually call that out um, at the University of Australia conference re recently. But, you know, it's that, that period of three years, um, some of you may have seen the original usage chart for that 56K line which was upgraded six months later to 128K and six months later to 512K and so on and so forth in the classic internet hockey curve kind of thing. And so there were the two things going on, kind of two dimensions to that early stage. There was having to go back to the Australian Vice Chancellor's Committee, who remember are a lobby group, right? Have the operational expertise of zero. Right? They, they don't. They don't deal with real stuff. Closed door session here tonight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, they're a lobby. They're right, a very good yeah. lobby group, and you know, yeah. and and they had launched this. And Ken McKinnon, the chair of the VCC at the time, was instrumental in taking this opportunity. Mm -hmm. You have to go back saying we need more money. Well, why do you need more money? Well, the network's full. Um, well, what do we do about that? 
uh, and, f and that, well, that was great because the, first, the other part of the job was encourage people to use it. We spent all this money on the network, we've got to use it. We don't want to you know, build it and no one comes situation. So we're busy telling the end users, you know, use the network more, here's this thing called the file transfer protocol, and here's email and, and so on. And, but at the same time, we had to fight these battles with um, uh, the AVCC around putting more funding into the network mm -hmm. uh, because the growth was completely bonkers. Um, sure, there would have been 40,000 hosts. Uh, all of us know that that was 40,000 university devices just connected by our net, yep. and we only ran 40-odd yeah, you know, devices. But um, it, it, was, it was a classic explosive growth scenario. It was um, com complete scrambling. Um, we ended up brokering the handing out of network addresses. And, and this in the days where you know, random university and go, would ring up and say, I need to get a network address. And I'd go, do you need more than 250 hosts? Yeah, well, all right, I'll get you a B. Uh, <laughs> and it just seems ridiculous now. So, uh, but they still have them. They still have them. <laughs> Don't let them go. Apparently they're worth money now. So, um, so but yeah, it was a pretty helter skelter period. And, uh, and we were balancing that, that promotion and, and use of the network, which turns out to still be pretty important. At the same time, trying to engineer um, the network to deal with the, com the capacity being presented to us. Yeah, and we certainly didn't have the uh, nobody will come problem. I did the numbers the other day and we have more than two and a half million people behind Arnett at universities and schools and mm. types around the country. And um, we heard a bit today about the impact that that, that has on, you know, we heard Sean Amy talking about uh, mm. uh, satellites and other things. Uh, astronomy and the like, and I just want to hear from you, um, you know, any example you'd like about what you think made an impact on uh, Australia as a country mm. or uh, on the internet uh, from, from the Arnet project, what came about that wouldn't have happened otherwise? So, this is one of those conversations that starts and never ends. <laughs> um, the, 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 the impact it can be taken in the micro or the macro, I've already talked about it, brought the internet to Australia. Um, but I remember my, my dad, who was an academic at the ANU, um, his first use of the internet was using his Macintosh to send emails. And he would send emails like he used to send letters. He would write a learned letter to his colleague in, uh, overseas and he would get back a learned reply. And so it was a classic case of, I'm doing exactly what I did before, but I'm doing an electronic medium. And, and, and so we saw a lot of that. Uh, people were exchanging documents uh, with attachments on emails and so on, and that was a better way of moving documents around. Uh, we had a fax gateway so we could transmit faxes over the internet um, more easily. So we were doing things more efficiently. This is kind of what technology is meant to do. Mm. But we were also starting to do new things, right? There were this, this the whole discipline of what we now call e-research using technology to support research was starting to explode, the use of supercomputers um, and you know, what, what Microsoft used to call the fourth paradigm, you know, simulating mm -hmm experiments in a digital uh, world, and that started to become huge. Uh, and people could access resources, so you know, we fixed the brain drain. People didn't need to go to the United States to access a supercomputer, you could do it from Australia and you can collaborate. Um, so they were, they, they were the first pieces, but you know, understand that when, when the internet arrived in 1989, and for the next couple of years, there was no wide World Wide Web, there was no audio or video of the internet. Um, there was no Google, there was no Facebook. Uh, you know, it's like you really had email file transfer. Right. But, but that in, the internet, the reason it won and defeated DECnet and even OSI is it was an open system and it was ubiquitously available and it, it encouraged innovation. And now we have innovation and massive technology disruption uh, as a result of the hyper-connectivity that the internet's enabled. And, and you know, all of that started from the university saying, I've got to stop people leaving this country, I've got to keep my research, researchers in Australia, and that's important to the nation. And it still is, and that's why we're still here. Yeah, amazing. And um, look, I, I want to say thank you for sharing with us, you know, what you have tonight. Um, I have one more question for you, and that's about the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we in this room, this is now the, the royal we, uh, have the opportunity to, to do what we think is right with Arnett and, and build the network and the company in the vein that we uh, think it needs to go and to service our, our stakeholders. But what do you think the biggest opportunity for the use of Arnett is? Um, the, the biggest 
opportunity for, for Arnet the network is really around um, raising the bar of expectation for our end user communities. Um, you know, we, we, we sometimes talk about, you know, it's a tragedy in this, this country that uh, the majority of schools uh, are probably connected at less than 20 or 30 megabits a second. Mm. That's a bloody outrage. You know, a, a teacher should never think, oh, is this going to, this video that I want to show to my student, is this going to work? Is it going to download in time? Will it cost me too much? Will I blow my budget? Will it work at all? Those things shouldn't happen. Um, we should never be in a situation where our researchers are going, um, I can't collaborate with my peers, I can't um, participate in, in global collaborations. And our job is to remove barriers, is you know, to take whatever traffic they put, put out to deliver whatever research they need, Arnett's job is to deliver that. And I think we're unbelievably well structured to do that. So I think, I think the opportunity with, with the network itself is all about what the use is made of it in partnership with our institutions, obviously, who house all the researchers and, and, and teaching and training and education that is embedded in the institutions, working with them to maximise people's expectations so they don't think, I can post this with a hard drive. Oh, drives me spare when that, you hear that. <laughs> post a USB stick. Don't do that. You know, share it, collaborate using digital. But the other part of, of Arnett is, is the magic of, of how it came to be that a collective in this case, the Australian Vice Chancellor's Committee, said we collectively need to make this investment. And that structure of a, a cooperative that is funded through subscriptions is, is unbelievably powerful. It, it means that a national facility can participate at global scale, uh, indeed lead a lot of global initiatives, through everyone pitching in. The big unis pay more because they use it more and they can pay more and the small unis pay less. And, the formulaic model is just so incredibly powerful to enable co-investment from both large and small research intensive and teaching intensive universities collectively. And that model could be used for a lot more. Exactly what? I don't know. But um, I think that model um, has a lot of promise. Uh, it enables the universities to do things they might not uh, otherwise have done. And it's all going to be enabled by connectivity in the network. So, you know, it's, it's nothing but uh, a positive future for our net. Uh, I think it's a really positive future for Australian education research because we're a long way from the rest of the world. There's not a lot of us on a really big patch of dirt. So networking matters. And for, for us to make the best of our education system and most of our research capacity, then that, our net's crucial to that. Here, here. Join me in thanking Peter. All right, thank you. Thank you.